Hey, good afternoon, everybody. It's time for another grab bag lesson, and I'm glad that you are in attendance. If you would, please um, go ahead and give us a record of your attendance by hitting the button below or whatever while I set this timer. I'm trying to keep myself on task here. And I, I, I'm not going to start the timer yet. I'm going to tell you why, because I have to be up front with you. This may take, I don't want to spend a lot of time at the beginning explaining this to you, but it may take a bit longer. I've been trying to keep it 30 minutes. We're in the last session at the end of John chapter six, and it's very, very difficult to get it all crammed in there, and I can't dump it over to another lesson. So um, I hope that you'll be patient. I hope it'll be uh, interesting and um, informative and educational enough that you will stay with us through the whole time. I'm, I'm not going to greatly abuse the time frame, but I will probably go over a little bit. And uh, so let me say that I hope these lessons have helped you grow in your faith. You know, when I study the word in anticipation of teaching a lesson or preaching a sermon, the word grows my faith. And I am, as has been said, and is very appropriate to these lessons on the bread of life, I am just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And I hope that this has helped you to get some spiritual food. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to teach and for using uh, these video lessons. And please let us know if there's any way that at the church, Norman Christian Church, we can help you, encourage you. And as I said, click on the button below and check in. I'm gonna have to jump up here real quick, just a second. See, one of the motivation, motivations I have for getting this done is that it is right now 12.41. I ate breakfast hmm, somewhere around 7 o'clock. No, it was before 7 o'clock. So it was between 6.30 and 7 o'clock. So I'm hungry. And my lunch is in the microwave. And I hit the button to heat it up. And now it's beeping to tell me that, hey, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. So there's motivation to get done too, right? So I can... Uh, have some lunch. Joy made homemade tomato soup with basil. Mm -mm, good. Better than Campbell's. So for the thrilling, con let me hit my timer, for the thrilling conclusion of John chapter 6, and it is thrilling, but it is also very sad. So we have 50 verses to cover, and we won't have time to do, therefore, verse by verse. So I'm going to have to cover in what I call just chunks and provide summations here and there. But I hope that you make time to read the text on your own. Um, maybe read those last, last pause here and read those last 50 verses and then come back or whatever. I hope you've been following along and that you've been reading John chapter 6 so that we can be up to speed. In verses 22 through 29, John relates that the crowd is confused, as you would expect, because Jesus is near Capernaum with his disciples when they arrive, and they, they can't figure that out, because when they left the night before, Jesus had sent them away, and they saw the disciples get in the boat and leave, and so they're wondering, how did Jesus get across the lake before we did? How could he be here to welcome us on this side of the lake? In answer to their queries about how he got across, Jesus takes the conversation in a different direction. He doesn't tell them about the storm, doesn't explain everything to them. He takes the conversation in a different direction. I keep mentioning that Jesus is at a crucial time in his history, and it is time to separate, as they say, the wheat from the shaft. For the crowd to be pushed to put up or to shut up. And Jesus cuts to the chase and he confronts them with their false motives for seeking him. You have one interest, he says, and that is getting free bread for your physical satiation. 
when what you truly should or must do is to desire spiritual food that does not spoil and that I can give you. You need a priority shift, so to speak. And I am telling you priority number one right now. Jesus says, believe in me, for God has sent me with his seal of authority. Now that's a summation. That's a, that's a chunk, so to speak. You know, some folks just have audacity in their personalities. You know, it's part of their modus operandi. And this group has it. The crowd had been filled to the gills miraculously with bread and fish by one man in one sitting using only five loaves of bread and two fish. And yet, according to John, they still have the, the guilt, or, or I'm sorry, the, <laughs> another fish rep, the gall to ask Jesus for a miraculous sign that will make them believe in him, that will make them believe that he has God's stamp of approval. I mean, can you say, duh? You remember all those jokes about here's your sign? Not like like the, the guy who asks his neighbor if he's washing his car. And the neighbor says, no, I'm watering it to see if it grows. Duh, here's your sign. What must Jesus do to break into these hard hearts and minds? He tells them he was sent by God. They've just had the sign of the feeding of the 5,000, and they have the audacity to say to Jesus, well, what... What miracle are you going to show us to prove that you're God's son? <laughs> Jesus draws them a verbal picture, a beautiful explanatory picture that drives the truck of truth right down Main Street and hits them where they stand. In verse 32, John writes, Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it's, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. Maybe I should insert here that they said to Jesus, what sign are you going to show us? You know, our ancestors had manna from heaven and the, the, uh, they were hinting at the fact that, well, Moses proved that he was a leader because he gave manna from heaven. So Jesus says, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, sir, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I, well, <laughs> Here's where we have to learn in chunks, and so we've got to move on quickly. But you know what? Notice that Jesus is just simply saying, I have the Father's stamp of approval. They're saying, show us a sign, give us a miracle. <laughs> and Jesus is telling them, you know, Moses gave you manna that was temporary. I am the manna from heaven. He paints them a picture. I'm the bread of life, and if you uh, the bread I give you, if you eat of it, you will never go hungry. You'll never get thirsty. Well, the crowd is getting restless. And it may be that even the disciples are getting nervous. In verse 41, John writes, at this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? So they're saying, you can't be the son of God. We, we know you. We saw you grow up. We know we're your hometown. We know your family. So, so why are you telling us stuff like that? They can't believe that Jesus really is the bread that comes down from heaven. And you know what? I think if we were there, we would probably be in the same situation of, of, of questioning and doubting and thinking. Because like I've said in the last lesson, we have the advantage of looking back. 
They didn't. This was happening in real time. And they were having to scramble their brains and, and with all of this thinking about Jesus. And so they were confused and they were grumbled and grumbling and they were questioning and they were doubting. Well, it seems from verse 43 that their grumbling lights a bit of a fire in Jesus. And he tells the crowd to stop grumbling. And then he reiterates the same teaching in verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. How many times does he have to say that? Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Uh, um, excuse me, Jesus? What was that last line you just added? Bread and manna and eternal food. I got all that. We've heard that before. You, you keep saying the same message and we're a little, but did, did I hear you right? Did you say that the bread is your flesh? Well, you hadn't said that before. So now the natives are really getting restless. Now they are arguing among themselves. John says that they started saying, how can he give us his flesh to eat? And I imagine there are probably some of the people in the background just going, ooh, that's gross. In verse 53, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Remember the Bible said, the Old Testament, life is in the blood, God said. God said, don't eat the blood of animals. But now Jesus is saying, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Because true spiritual life can only be found through the sacrificial blood of Jesus. But like I said, we look at that in reverse. They didn't. You know, they didn't uh, have that advantage that we have. In verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Yeah, we know that, Jesus. You keep saying that over and over and over again. Jesus is making a point, and he wants to drive it home and wants these people to understand. The purpose of the feeding of the 5,000, the multiplication of the bread, had nothing to do with physical hunger. Jesus was making a point. I am the bread of life. And you remember in our last lesson, Mark wrote that they did not understand the meaning of the bread. And so Jesus is just driving home. This is what all of that meant, that I am the bread of life. Quit chasing after this physical, temporary stuff that will fill you for a bit, but then leave you empty. Seek me. Follow me. I am the bread of life. Can you understand why some people believe that early Christians were cannibals? I mean, they met in secret. They heard that the followers of, you know, of Jesus were eating flesh and drinking blood. Of course, it was reference to communion. But if you weren't part of the fellowship, that's all you heard. And you thought, man, this is a cult. They have to hide away. They're talking about eating flesh and drinking. And so they thought, mistakenly, of course, that first century Christians were cannibals. Well, Jesus' audience that we're talking about here in John chapter 6 didn't understand Jesus' words about the body and the blood either. They didn't understand that this was a prophecy 
about Jesus' upcoming death. And I've said it before, to be candid, that if, if we had been in the audience that day, you know, we probably wouldn't have understood either. Jesus, how did you get from bread and water to flesh and blood? What did we miss? Where was the transition? I would imagine that the 12 were just as confused as the crowd. And they were wondering if Jesus, you know, hey, Jesus, did you hit your head in the boat during the storm uh, or getting out of it? You know, have you been too long in the sun? What, what, are, what are you saying? So after this startling revelation Jesus gave about himself, John tells us that the crowd became even more agitated. You'll find that in verse 52. But yet Jesus keeps pounding home his critical point in verses 53 through 58. As I mentioned earlier, it was time for the crowd to follow Jesus on his spiritual terms and not on their physical earthly kingdom terms. Would they do what was necessary to truly understand Jesus? Would they stay as disciples to learn Jesus's true purpose? See, Jesus drew the line in the sand with his difficult to understand teaching. Would they cross over to his side? Were they truly committed Verse 60 says, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Now, most of you are aware that Jesus had more than just 12 disciples. The, you know, we often refer to the disciples, and we, we mean the 12, but the Bible often says that Jesus had so many disciples around him. They were people who followed him because they wanted to learn from him. The 12 were an inner circle. They were specifically chosen by Jesus, but there were many disciples who were invited to follow Jesus, and many did, including uh, women. So when John writes that many of his disciples said that this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? We know that it may have included the 12, and it included Judas, for sure, but it was a much larger crowd. It was the crowd that had migrated from Capernaum and the feeding of the, I'm sorry, Bethsaida and the feeding of the 5,000 down to Capernaum. So this was a large crowd to whom he was speaking. And we mentioned that Many of them, especially the 12, were on the bubble. Remember talking about that last lesson. They were on the bubble about completely trusting Jesus. They had their doubts. And this statement by Jesus about flesh and blood consumption probably confused them, the 12, as much as the larger crowd of disciples. So Jesus is speaking to the 12. He's speaking to this large crowd. He's saying these things that people are totally confused about, and they begin to argue about, and they're grumbling. They, oh. And their response is, who can accept this? Now, the word translated in NIV as accept has the root akuo, from which we get our word acoustic. And acoustic, of course, involves the ears and hearing. And so you'll find some versions that translate it as who can hear this, or who can understand it, or who can listen to it. Maybe the, the paraphrase, the message, says it in a down-to-earth way we truly understand. The message says that the people ask, who can swallow it? <laughs> I like that. You know, who can understand it? Who can hear it? Who can figure this out? And <laughs> who can swallow that line of what Jesus is saying? 
anyway, each version is, version is trying to inform us that the people were confused and just could not wrap their minds around what Jesus was teaching. And as I said, I think if we were there, we may have been in the same boat. In verses 61 to 65, another chunk, John tells us that Jesus is aware of their grumbling, but he keeps asking questions and he keeps teaching, challenging the people to think. Tough leaders often have to experience disappointments when attempting to inspire others to greatness, to new worldviews, to new ways of thinking. And Jesus was no different. He is about to experience the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, except in reverse. He's going to experience the agony of defeat and the thrill of victory. And now we're going to discover why I've been saying that this juncture in Jesus's ministry was absolutely crucial. In verse 66, John, this is John's spirit-led assessment of the fallout from Jesus's sermon. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and they no longer followed him. Maybe there's something ominous about this being John 6, 6, 6. From that time on, many of the peoples, it's almost like, as we say, threw up their hands. Said, I don't understand this. I, I can't believe this. I'm not staying here. And, and they turned back and no longer followed him. I can only imagine, and I never want to experience, what it would feel like to be preaching when slowly but surely all of the attendees stand and walk out the door. How, how many people do you think at the beginning of the day were on the Jesus train? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then Jesus started talking, and they stepped off. I don't know. I mean, there were 5,000 men, not counting women and children, the night before. How many gathered to hear that sermon on the bread of life, thinking that they'd get another free handout? But they all walked away. Whatever the number, they bailed. So let's do a quick regroup. I don't think for a moment that Jesus was caught unaware at the reaction. He knew the selfish earthly mood and mentality of the crowd. They were driven by personal satisfaction and the fill them up bread and fish buffet had blinded them to Jesus' spiritual meaning behind the miracle. And John, if you remember, said that they were ready to come and force Jesus to be an earthly king. I, I should have taken off the phone, sorry. So Jesus, what, so, why would the National Republic Convention be calling me? I have no idea. But anyway, um, so the feet, we got to get back on here, on the train here. Um, so the feeding of the 5,000. And I'm going to get that phone. I know it's old-fashioned parlance, but I took it off the hook. Okay, there we go. So I was talking about doing a regroup. What I'm going to do is do a review of John chapter 6. And the fact that Jesus wasn't for a moment caught off guard by the people's reaction to his teaching. Why? Because he knew that they had a selfish, earthly mentality. They were driven by personal satisfaction. They had, as I said, been at the fill them up uh, bread and fish buffet, and they were thinking totally 
physical. They weren't thinking spiritually. And we know from the first part of John chapter 6 that what Jesus then decided to do, when the people said, or he at least sensed, that they were going to come and make him, a, try to make him a physical king, it's like Jesus was saying, wait a second, this is not my purpose. This is not my goal. And so he sent the people, he sent the disciples out on the lake. He sent the people away. And the Bible says he stayed by himself and he went alone to be with his father. I, I, I see it as kind of like a meeting in the locker room to reassess strategy at halftime. That long night of prayer with the Father alone would have recharged him, it would have reset him with resolve. Like, stick to the game plan, Jesus. Preach the message. Maybe even as, as they did in the Garden of, of Gethsemane, maybe the angels came and they ministered to him. And they you know, helped prop up his weary, burdened soul. Maybe the Father even spoke very quietly as he did the words at Jesus' baptism. Maybe he spoke and said, look, you're my beloved son, and I am well pleased with you. Whatever happened there, what I see is Jesus walking from that time of prayer straight out onto the lake with resolve and new purpose. After the calming of the storm, then he arrived on the other side, again, resolved and knowing what most preachers should know and remember, that tickling ears for popularity doesn't cut it. Sometimes the truth must cut to the quick before it heals and gives greater strength. That's exactly what happened with the gospel message on the day of Pentecost. The people were cut to the heart, the Bible says. That's what the truth sometimes has to do before healing can occur. And I think Jesus began that talk, that sermon on the bread of life with, with the belief that even if the 12 walked, they walked. But he was not going to dumb down his message. He wasn't going to change it. He wasn't going to conform to what the crowd wanted, the kind of king the crowd wanted him to be. In fact, if anything, he was going to raise the level to a newer level that would require the truly committed to stay and keep learning. Jesus would preach a sermon that would separate the spiritual men from the fleshly boys. And it did. Now, watching the people leave had to break Jesus' heart. He loved the people. He wanted them to want to know him, to struggle with the truth, the truth that he revealed, and he wanted them to be saved through it. And now he had to face a most critical moment. The people have left. What about the twelve? Would they stay when everyone else was leaving? Would the negative peer pressure be too great? Would everything he had worked for for three years fall apart? Would the plan of redemption suffer a major setback and require a restart with new people? In other words, if the disciples left, what then? Does he go off looking for more and saying, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men and try to restart the whole ministry? Imagine the hurt and the tentative sound in Jesus' voice when he turns to the disciples and he sincerely asks, and I wish I was an actor that could portray this, but when he turns to the guys and just says, um, they're all gone, you don't, you don't want to go too, do you? Imagine the deafening silence as Jesus waited for a response. Because what if they say yes? What if they go? Well, then Peter speaks for the group. Lord, to whom shall we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And I like Peter's double emphasis. We have come to believe and we know. It's not just head stuff. We believe it and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Now, my writing skills are not adequate to express what the heart of Jesus must have felt. All I can see is a pensive face suddenly lighting up with a smile that spanned all of heaven. I can hear the intake of a monumental breath, and with arms raised to the sky, and maybe even with a fist pump, I think the external joy of Jesus could not match the internal rush that poured from between his lips in a shout of, yes, yes, they get it. And they may not understand it all, but they're not going to go. They're going to stay. The 12 didn't fully understand what this decision would cost them. Because they were, as Jesus said, little children of faith. Children of little faith. They doubted. They had a long way to go. But they stayed. When so many walked away, they stayed. They put their commitments to Jesus before their commitments to themselves. They stayed. I think Jesus was probably thinking, man, now I have some real wet cement that I can work with to form a foundation for my church. Perhaps Jesus jumped up and down, or maybe he played it cool you know, with, with understated body language. Whichever it was, John tells us that eventually Jesus brought up a sobering afterthought. And John records that. Jesus asks, have I not chosen you, yet one of you is a devil? Devil, the Greek word, is diabolos. And it means a false accuser. And that's exactly what Satan is. That's exactly what Jesus would, Judas would do, falsely accuse. We're getting close. <laughs> Was Jesus making a point to Satan and to Judas? You were deceivers. You may have the others fooled, but not me. Be aware that I see you. You just tried to derail my father's plan, but you just lost a mighty battle. What's he saying to Judas? Judas, you stayed. You're, you're, you're with everybody else, and that's great. But I want you to know, I see you. I know your heart. If, <coughs> excuse me. If popularity is your thing, then following Jesus is not your thing. Not that you should live a life of depression and self-martyrdom. Jesus gives life abundant, and there is joy in knowing we have an inheritance in heaven. But popularity by the world standards will be hard to come by if you live a life disciplined by the Spirit and the Word. If you find yourself a sought-after social fixture and the one everyone wants at their homes and parties, you just might want to check your spiritual temperature. Because our true life is waiting in eternity, so don't sacrifice tomorrow on the altar of popularity today. Jesus wouldn't do that. If they walked away, they walked away. He wasn't concerned with popularity with the crowd. His concern was popularity with his Father, and that should be our number one concern. Be faithful, friends. Stay with Jesus when the rest of the world walks away. After all, where else can you go when only Jesus has the words of eternal life? I believe the 12 stayed, yes, and even Judas for a bit longer, 
because Jesus truly was life to them. And there was no rational alternative than to be his disciple. Where else could they go, Peter said. It's like he's saying, we would be stupid to go anywhere else. The most rational thing is to stay with you. And so it is with you and me. There is no other alternative to Jesus that provides eternal life. So a couple questions to close this grab bag session. Question number one, would the disciples have been as confident about Jesus if they had not seen the power of God at a good time, the feeding of the 5,000, and at a frightening time on the lake in the middle of a storm? Would Peter have been so bold to make his statement about Jesus if he had never experienced his water rescue? Although, there's no way we would know. But they're questions worth pondering, and they lead me to my closing point. Having a faith history that's accrued by witnessing God work in our lives in both good times and difficult, frightening times, builds our faith from, oh, you of little faith, to my child with great faith. And that growth builds our confidence to stand with Jesus, even when the rest of the world walks out on him and rejects him. You know, when we first become Christians, I really believe that Satan comes at us really strong. Because that's when we're weakest. That's when we don't have a faith history. That's, you know, we've made this commitment to stay with Jesus. And he wants to cut our props out from under us early to make us doubt and turn back. But the, the more we stay with Jesus through the difficult times that, like I said, probably come initially because Satan thinks that'll move us away. When we see Jesus acting in our lives and in the lives of others in difficult times as well as in positive times, then we start building up that history in our spiritual memories. Then that builds our faith. It gives us confidence to stay with Jesus when everybody else walks away, when everybody else laughs, when everybody else mocks, we stay with Jesus. Those testimonies become ammunition that we fire at Satan when times get tough and following Jesus seems a lonely journey. So thank you for <laughs> giving me your ear, so to speak. Thank you for taking your time. It's, it's a great gift that you give the church that you give the Father, and it's a great gift to me personally that you would take the time um, to, to walk along with me uh, through the scripture. And so my final challenge for you is to remain faithful because who else has the words of eternal life? The only one who has the words of eternal life <laughs> is the bread giver, and the storm master. And in that, those two ways, from John chapter 6, Jesus proved that he is indeed the Son of God. Let me pray. And because of what you showed us, Father, we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing that, we have life in your name. Thank you for the Gospel of John, for John's purpose of preserving these miracles so that we can come to know you and identify you as the Son of the living God. I pray for my brothers and sisters that their faith would grow because they study the Word, and I pray that you would give them confidence to stand strong and to be bold even if everybody else walks out, to stand with your son, to stand with Jesus. And I pray this in his mighty name.
Amen. I love you. Take care.